this episode of The Silburn Show, the Solution-Oriented Summit, creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking solutions and impacting actions, tackling knife and gun crime in our community. Let it not be our legacy. Uh, presentation is um, something that I um, I run with uh, graduate students um, at our university here, and um, so but I'll rush through it because I know we, we, we have to uh, be mindful of time. Uh, just a bit of background: um, I was in the Met for 30 years, and um, one of the main things uh, we set up uh, was the Black Police Association, which I was last year and prime member. And with the BPA we, we set up a, a youth leadership program in 2001 and that's still running to this very day. Uh, it's, it used to be part of the BPA Charitable Trust, it's now called Voyage, it's called Voice of the Youth and Gender Empowerment. And that was um, one of the key starts for me to really look at my crime from an educational point of view. And in fact, I set up reality, and it's not a misspelling, it's an acronym, uh, raising everyone's awareness of lives lost in the youth. And it's not just losing their lives, but their hope and aspirations, and you know, motivation against the grooming and the negative peer groups. So that's uh, been running for 11 years with Voyage, and I'd like to think it's helped me to assist in the solutions. So that's a bit of background. Um, so what I want us to try and aim for is get um, why is the risk of knife kind of gun crime? How we, we may fall into the gaps of safeguarding net because it, one of the issues at the moment is safeguarding agencies are reducing and people are grooming the young people on the streets, sometimes grooming in their own homes or if they don't care, whatever, those are increasing in numbers. And the sort of risk-based crime enforcement fit uh, model is it fit for purpose. I mean, you can't arrest you without this problem. You can't stop and search you without this problem. You've got to work with young people at the centre, especially when uh, sort of highlighted those young people are suffering from adverse childhood experiences in the home, what they see on the streets, social media. In fact, social media is the accelerant to a lot of grooming, a lot of conditioning, and some young people think it's a, what's the point, I'm gonna end up in crime, in violence, or end up there before I'm 25 or even 20. And, you know, they're just resigning to the fact that these things are gonna happen. So it's a question of breaking that cycle. And of course, the solutions. Um, so, the risk factors. Now, I think a lot of us will, will know. Um, dysfunctional homes, the trauma, as I've just spoken about. Certain crime infested areas fueled by street crime, and that includes drug supply. Um, if you're born in those disadvantages, there's a good chance, not always, but there's a good chance that you're going to get into that cycle, you know, just by accepting, oh, go and run an errand for me. Now, if you're 11, 12 years old, and these are people you've grown up with. Some of them, you admire them, they're very charismatic, very, very influential. And you then take that hundred pounds just to run an errand or hold a weapon or carry some drugs for them, you're then caught. And that's invariably where the cycle can start. Um, and if you are then getting money for this, you think, why you go to school? If I'm going to get myself in debt for education, and all of a sudden I can get four, five hundred pounds just to run an errand, and there's not being groomed in home in the home. So no, you can't bring that money in here, and you tell that friend you will have nothing to do with them. So these are sort of things that have to be offset. And if you've got this peer-to-peer -peer pressure, keeping young people into this mindset, oh, quick money and I can get the crepes and the guns and the cars and the girls. Hey, there's a lot of um, enticement. So these are, these are the sort of things that we really need to look at. 
So it's the whole list of trauma, crime infested areas, urban deprivation, social exclusion, drug and alcohol abuse, which we've already touched on. And the solution programs need to be looking at joined up intervention and prevention programs. And not just statutory, but uh, non statutory, because I think people in the community who have a real cultural understanding of what's going on will be more, um, just as important as statutory agencies to do those interventions and prevention. And as I said, police must move from a crime enforcement focus to a more public health approach, but I'll touch on that a bit later. Now, some of us, anyone from Jamaica here? Don't be, don't be shy. Say we're pride. I know you told me you told me to make it. Actually, I've got an account with you, you people. Um, you're still not giving me updates, but anyway, that's question. <laughs> this, um, some of us would, you know the, where this um, album cover comes from? No? Yeah? Uh, okay, anyone good at Google, young people? Anyway, that was an album cover, and it said Born for Dead. So it's like this it was a Jamaican um, reggae group, and they thought it was uh, inevitable. We're just going to live our life and just dead when we're going And I don't know if you know, but youth culture is heavily influenced the whole world over by Jamaicans. A lot of it through the dance hall and the reggae, but youth culture across the, I would say, the Western world. Heavily influenced by Jamaican. And I'm not saying it's because of Jamaica we've got the violence, but unfortunately, highlighting the negative has a real influence. Even in, in America and the rap music, they have a real steer on uh, Jamaican culture. Now, gangs are not um, new, and a lot, a lot of them go on for um, many years. Postcode affiliations. This didn't just happen overnight, you know, your Peckham boys and your, your Harrogate Tottenham boys, all these affiliations, they just didn't happen overnight. The late 90s, and this is information research from University College London with Professor Ben Bowling. Crack cocaine supply. London was saturated with crack cocaine, late 90s, early 80s. And as a result of that, you had young people on the streets, not so involved in gangs, but man them just hanging on the road, who were able to be groomed into spying drugs. I was a borough commander in Hackney, I saw it happen as a sergeant and also the superintendent. All of a sudden, you had an easily conceivable, easily transferable, high market commodity. Has anyone ever seen crack again? It's like candle wax wrapped in cellophane. So they can keep it in their mouth, and when a client or someone they're going to buy off them, they spit it out of their mouth. If they get approached by police, they swallow it. So I'm hoping it doesn't burst in their intestine, and it goes through the intestine. So all of a sudden, young people were supplying So we would be stopping young people with five, six, seven hundred pounds in their pocket, and they're not even fifteen. Where are you getting it from? I'm working. Are you only fifteen? Where are you working? All these sort of things. And then they started to have this demarcation. So in certain neighbourhoods, certain estates, that was their turf. That was their ends. So if they see someone who looks like them, they're going to be threatened by them. It doesn't necessarily involve resort to violence in the early days, but now it's almost inevitable. If, but no disrespect, for us, those of us who are my age group, we can walk around the state, not a problem, because they don't think that individual is involved. It's normally an age and class issue. Some um, come up in certain areas, but invariably, at a certain age, if they're similar, mid to late teens, they get very threatened by it, and it's even younger now. And I said, social media is perpetuating this bad boy image, in addition to the videos, and that they've got this big thing about drill music at the moment. Now, drill music is not the cause for violence, but you have millions of views of this drill music, doesn't mean that millions of people are going out to stab people. However, it, it is actually 
highlighting their experience of reality and a lot of it is around drug supply and the violence that goes with it. And of course the fear factor, which you've already heard about, and where knives can be used, or even guns, are used on a regular basis. So the gangster gamma, glamour, that's nothing new. Remember, you know, even Elvis Presley, for those of us who can remember that, was going to talk about being a bad boy and everything. And we've heard about that for decades. So it's nothing new. But it's the way it's, I, I believe, it's been indoctrinated through social media. And of course, the fact that police are not getting into the intervention conventions and problem solving piece and just working a lot around enforcement, which is something I've been talking about since the Steve Lawrence inquiry. They need to be a lot more uh, proactive, but unfortunately, things have got worse. In fact, I would say we're in a pre Lawrence era of the early 90s, 25 years ago, when, you know, unfortunately, we've got a lot of police accountability being reduced and we're not seeing that real proactivity that we need to see. So, for me, it's a sad situation. Now, we've got other um, proper gangs, and I'll give it a definition of that. So, in Manchester, in Birmingham, in London. But also, we've got gangs in Glasgow. I've been up to Glasgow, where they do a totally different uh, approach around the public health approach, which I'll touch on. But all their gangs are white, and the stabbings are, uh, and some shootings are mainly um, based on uh, sectarianism. It's nothing to do with crack cocaine supply. A lot of it is around uh, religious beliefs. That's the definition of a gang. It consists of three people. Use a name, emblem, colour, or has any characteristics that enables members to be identified by others as a group and is associated with a particular area. That's the Policing and Crime Act of 2009. And that's the, the, the definition. So, in all honesty, if your um, child or children in a community um, sometimes aren't aware they are classed as a gang because three of them might be involved in you know, negative behaviour or a certain type of crime. You see a lot of them um, going around on their bikes with mopeds and um, might carry out certain street crime or just being antisocial. By this definition, it's, wide, um, it's got a wide definition. And I think one of the reasons why we got this wider scope, has anyone heard about joint enterprise? Yes. Now, the, the lawyer will know Joint enterprise is not a law, it's a doctrine. And it was actually used 200 years ago when, when they used to have duels, you know, I'll meet you at dawn with the swords or the pistols at dawn. Well, they had joint enterprise to arrest the, the people who were supporting those individuals and being caught. So they're adapting an archaic doctrine into current and affairs. Okay, um, I think this just touches on uh, a lot of the influencing um, of gangs. The Matrix. Has anyone heard of the gangs matrix? Right, some of you might know that each borough has a list of young people and they are assessed in terms of risk. Red, amber and green. High risk red, low risk green. And also if they have young people on the margins. Now they don't necessarily have to be involved in a gang or involved in that definition. It might be they're associated with that individual. And the, the, the really important thing is they can collect information from all sorts of indices. It's not just police intelligence reports. For example, if a young person goes into say uh, a job center and says right I need a job. So let's just say and that individual is in E17, Walkingstone. And that um, um, young person is offered... Is ...to turn their life around. Yeah. So would, if they're on that matrix, would they come off of that if they become much lower risk? Well, um, I only know of one person... What, it was one officer in the case who said, I don't think that, should, that person should be on the matrix. 
And the only reason why he did that is because he was involved in when the matrix was brought in and it was seen, he said, listen, it's a blunt tool, just like stop and search, it's a blunt tool that is supposed to assist the officer's investigation, not the be all and end all. And so he was the only one that said, actually, that matrix, uh, that young man should run the matrix. Now, I know he was going to um, put in a request for it to be taken off. Till this day, that was about a year ago, we still don't know. So it's still a new model, and I don't, they don't have that process. Amnesty International reported only a month ago that it's racially discriminatory, because 80% of people on the matrix are black, or African Caribbean. And lastly, the mayor, um, I did some work with the mayor on his, up to his election, and uh, one of the things I put through was for the matrix to be reviewed. He hasn't been carrying out a review, and we're still waiting for what his deputy mayor for police and crime is going to do. So this is one of the solutions. A lot of our young people don't even know this. So you need to go back and tell whoever your child is or you're a guardian for or other parents. Let them know that could be one of the issues. That's you, sucking them into it. Could you find out more about it with a freedom of information request? Absolutely. You can get an FOI request. I was going to go after that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, this goes in, there's very similar things to how young people are groomed into terrorism, and just like how the indices of, of, for the matrix is not just police, it's from other agencies, it's, it's a very, very similar thing to the Counterterrorism and Security Act of 2015, where there's a statutory duty for specified authorities to, to get information on uh, anyone who they believe are not reporting the British values and might be at risk being involved in terrorism. But that's a, a, another story, but there's similar themes. So I won't go into that because of time. Um, there's a big issue around unconscious bias. Um, I've seen it before I joined the police service, I've seen it in police service. In fact, the only time we were starting to really address these issues was from the Steve Lawrence inquiry and the recommendations. Because we had independent oversight and officers were being um, monitored on all of these um, types of behaviour. And some of you might know, I was one of the officers that said that the police service was institution racist at the Steve Lawrence inquiry. So we had robust processes and practices to try and address these issues. You can influence parties, not just in the main Forum, but even the fringe meetings. So we're trying to see how the evidence brings it up today. Because violence now is certainly different to violence 10 years ago. And I'd like to think that the, the commission work is going to be owned by the community. Um, because you've got to learn from what they did in Glasgow, reduced the night crime by 40%, by having network of practitioners. So if you've got an expertise in this work, uh, or even you've got expertise in just your community, or you know um, as an active parent, please uh, go on to our website, it's youthviolencecommission.com, and you can easily um, join us. in Because I think it's people power, and we've got to own something that's saying these are what the issues, and it's not the assumption about their gangs and drill music, because all of that is assumptions. And when they talk about knife, I'm sorry, stop and search has reduced and knife crimes increased, that is absolute, well, um, said before, it's an illusion. If you're carrying a gun or a knife, would you be equipment? So, for example, my son went to a forest school thing the other day and um, he had to take a carving knife. So, with him carrying that knife in his bag, would, would, would he be a criminal? The, um, most knives come under the Crime Prevention Act, and it's, if you have a weapon that is made of arms, like some of these zombie knives, there's no, no other reason for them to have a zombie knife, okay? These serrated edges, about a foot long, etc. So, you will be charged, well you'll be arrested and charged for that.
the actual working through with them and getting them back onto the straight and narrow. It doesn't seem to be happening through those um, measures. What's your thoughts on that? As I said, uh, through austerity, especially since 2013, public services, you funding teams even further into along the single system with uh, defending institutions, they have no capacity because they've got an increased number of clients, less opportunity to give any intervention or prevention. And so you're not getting the rehabilitation like in a youth defending team as you used to. Um, unfortunately, they are uh, seeing a bit, bit just like keeping the lid on it. You know, it's just a treadmill as it than what it was, say, 10 years ago. Um, when I was at Hackney, I used to work my youth vending team, and we had a mobile intervention outreach proactivity. So we were dealing with youngsters before they come into the yachts. Because you see, they were at risk. So we'd be working with them through detached workers. I wouldn't be getting my officers to deal with them at all. It's through my detached workers would be intervening with them, and that lost commodity called youth workers. They weren't just um, being nice to young people and taking them on day trips. They were actually advocates for those young people. You said that it, the government could do a lot, do you? In terms of the actual, from the police, how much um, kind of, um, what's the word? How much, how much can they do um, alone as an organisation about having to have the support from the government to be more proactive in, in what they do? Because um, so I'm a, I'm a youth leader with the Fire Brigade and they have their life programme. What I've kind of been looking at and talking to some like safe and able teams is whether the Met has a scope to kind of do something similar in terms of that kind of youth engagement. Mm -hmm. Now I've kind of heard a bit about what Voyage does, but if it's like a proper Met affiliated sponsored programme and whether that would need direct government influence, um, advocation and funding or whether the Met has the capacity and or the willpower to do it for themselves? Good question. Give a round of applause. This young man is on it. Um, right. In late 90s, no, sorry, late 80s, um, 1989, I set up the second uh, volunteer cadet corps in the police. So that system has been going for 30 years. I don't see them building that as they should because. Um, that is a way of engaging young people, similar to like army cadets, navy cadets, police cadets can be a lot more of a critical mass and more diverse than it should be. So I truly believe they could be doing a lot more to build up those ranks. In fact, I was tweeting about it. They have come up to their 30 years, they should be supported a lot more. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, I wanted to get Voyage um, up and running from the early O's because there needs to be a culturally competent um, program for young people. But earlier, because the um, volunteer cadet, cadet start at 16, but I wanted to go earlier, so we start at 14, 15. So I truly believe that the, the young people need to be engaged at a much earlier age. If I could do voyage in primary schools, I'll go into primary schools. Yeah. Right? Now, when I was in Hackney, we set up, um, again, one of the first safer neighbour teams. And that's when each ward had a sergeant, two constables, and three police community sport officers. Per ward. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on the Silburn Show. And uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos, share the videos and subscribe to the channel let people know about it but important thing is also to comment let us get your comment let's get your views so we can understand how to even please you better ladies and gentlemen so as i said share like subscribe ah thank you i saw you there you subscribe and you shared thank you so much see you next time